Okay. Um, uh, good morning. My name is uh, Paul Benaskovic. I work at Queen Elizabeth Hospital Gateshead. For the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be taking you through examination of the hip. For an exit fellowship examination of the hip, not only will a candidate have to demonstrate that he's able that, that the examiners see and appreciate each part of the, uh, their examination, um, but they also, it'll become immediately apparent to the examiners if you've developed a, a routine. And developing a, a set routine in the weeks prior to the exa real exam will make sure that everything flows smoothly and no steps are forgotten. So exam hip etiquette hip is very important and at the minimum, even for the short cases, you should introduce yourself to the patient, ask permission to examine their hip, ask if their hip is painful, and explain what you're going to do. You need to listen to what the examiner says, look as though you've examined the hip before, uh, think about what you will find, and appear confident to the examiners. And at the end, you have to wash your hands between every case, and don't forget to thank the patient. So although examination of the hip should be considered a continuous process, for ease of purpose, we break it down into a number of different subsets. That's um, inspection, standing the patient up. That's the look part of Apple's look, feel, and move. Gait, walking the patient. Chandelenburg test. Palpation, Thomas test. Uh, range of movement, leg length discrepancy, special tests, and neurovascular status. We examine for leg length discrepancy after range of movement because we want to make sure that we pick up any um, fixed contracture because legs need to be placed in equivalent positions when we're measuring for leg lengths. So inspection from the front, does the patient stand up tall and straight at both sho shoulders level? Uh, I look and see at this stage if the legs externally rotated, it may indicate that there's an old surface disease present in one of the hips. I look, also look and feel for both anterior superior expands. They should be at the same level. If they're not, pelvic obliquity is present. With an abduction deformity, it's raised up. With an abduction deformity, it's raised down. At this stage, I get the patient to, can you, I ask them to pull in their legs, uh, feet together, and bend their knees back. And immediately, any leg length discrepancy should be unmasked. And if it's present, I might want to ask for blocks at this stage. I then look to see if there's any fire uh, scar, scars or any fire calf muscle wasting. I look at the feet to see if there's any deformities present and anything else positive, but I don't really want to waste a lot of time going through a long list of negative findings. It uses up a lot of time. It doesn't necessarily score me any extra marks and it might actually irritate the examiners. From the back, I look to see if there's an increased lumbar lordosis suggestion, suggesting that there's uh, a fixed contracture of the hip. At this stage, I'll pick up, I'll lift up the underpants and look to see if there's any scars present or sinuses. I'll also have a quick look at the knee to see if there's a, a contracture there as well, because that's quite quite a nice way to do that. Uh, from behind, is the spine straight or scoliotic? If it's scoliotic, I'll be immediately be thinking about getting the patient to, to sit on the couch before I lie them down to see if the curve is structural functional. Is there any gluteal muscle wasting? That's a very strong indicator of hip disease. Uh, what's the alignment of the lower legs? Again, I look at the popliteal fossa. Is it equal or, or unequal, suggestive of a leg length discrepancy? Is the foot um, plantar grade or is the varus valgus? I get the patient at this stage to, to bend down. This is just a screening test, uh, forward flexion of the spine. I'm looking at the rhythm and symmetry of movement. Normally it should be quite smooth if it's painful and restricted. I'm thinking about referred pain from the uh, hip into the spine. Gait is next, you want to walk the patient. Ask the patient to, to walk away from you and walk towards you. You're looking to see if they're walking in a straight line and if their shoulder remains level. There's lots and lots of gait patterns. I think the three most important ones to be aware of are intalgic Trendelenburg and short leg gait. And you have to be quite careful if you mention these terms in the exam that you've got a, a definition to provide for the, for the examiners. So with an intalgic gait, the, the patient avoids putting weight on their painful hip. There's a shortened stance phase. And with this, the patient leans in on over to the affected side. Um, and this has the effect of moving the center of gravity nearer to the femoral head. So it reduces the counterbalancing forces that are required to be generated across the painful abductor muscles and therefore reduces the compression that occurs on the painful hip. 
with a Trendelenburg test, there's a dipping down of the pelvis opposite to the uh, affected weight-bearing stance leg. Uh, with this dropping down of the pelvis, the center of gravity shifts to the pelvis that's dropping down, and the patient usually has to compensate and they throw their upper body over to the weight-bearing leg, shifting the center of gravity uh, again, closer to the femoral head to avoid falling over. It's all to do with biomechanics, Trendelenburg, and uh, the intelligent gait. It's moments around the hip. Uh, it's the force times distance. So you're reducing the distance so that you reduce the moments that need to be counterbalanced. With a short leg gait, there's a regular even dip of the leg on the affected side. It's only usually apparent if there's greater than two centimeters leg length discrepancy, and there's an exaggerated dip down and shift of the center of gravity. It's a, but the, in contrast to the intelligent gait, it's a, it's a regular stance phase. It's not an uneven stance phase. With Trendelenburg tests, this is one a test that you really need to be at home with. Be prepared to be grilled about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the significance of a positive test. The, the um, keys to success are to explain first and demonstrate what you want to do to the patient. There's a large number of different variations of the test. The original test was described with the examiner from behind looking at the venous, dim, dimples of venous dip up and down with, with movements. Most of us feel more comfortable performing the test from in front. We can reassure the patient. We can see if the, the hip is painful. We can watch to see that they maintain the balance and we can catch them because you don't really want the patient to fall over in, in, in the exam. It's not, not particularly good. So... There's a number of different tests. I, I, I prefer uh, method one myself. That, um, that, as I said, the examiner can perform the test standing up. He can be sitting down in a chair. He can be kneeling down. He can get the uh, patient to place the, their arms on the examiner's shoulders, forearms or elbows, uh, or anterior superior spine. So method one, it's accurate because my hand's are over the anterior superior spine. Patients... Uh, arms, uh, hands rest on my shoulder. It's, 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 it's quite a sensitive test, that. And I, it's slightly awkward sometimes if the, if, if the patient's quite small, but I think if you keep practicing that, you, you get slicker at it and it looks fine. Method two is probably the best method in the clinic. It's a very accurate way, but I would urge you, sitting in a chair, you can't always find the chair in the, in the intermediate cases, and you probably certainly won't be able to find the chair in, in the short cases, so I wouldn't base your base your test on this because you could come unstuck. Method three is quite good. Uh, it's probably slightly less accurate than method one, but you're able to demonstrate what you want to the patient quite easy, and you're standing up straight and you don't sort of not crouching down. So it's, it's a perfectly acceptable method. Four, some people do four. It's sort of kneeling into the groin. It's difficult to, to explain what you want. Uh, with the patient, uh, you're talking to the groin and it doesn't always look good. I've seen it used and people do it very well and very slick and get away with it. So, but you've got to be careful about that. And method five, I'm not sure really what, what advantages it does offer. What I would say is that just, just stick with one method that works for you. So the test, you test the good side first and you get the patient to, to stand on the effect, uh, good, good leg, kick the affected leg backwards. And normally the pelvis should stay level or slightly rise and the patient should be able to hold this for 30 seconds. If it isn't, uh, doesn't, if, if there is some weakness of the abductor muscles, there's a dipping down of the pelvis. If all goes wrong, just think, sound side, sags. So the reasons for a positive test uh, are a failure of power, lever arm, or pivot. So a power failure could be a generalized muscular disorders, generalized neurological conditions, or more localized conditions, superior gluteal nerve injury, um, abductor osteotomy, uh, the hardinge approach to the hip, that's weakened the abductor muscles. For a lever arm failure, that's really shortened neck and fractured neck of femur, coxavera, and that's again this force times distance, this moments around the hip, because there's a, a big mechanical disadvantage when you uh, shorten the muscles uh, method of action. For pivot failure, that's just the failure of stabilization of the pivot, DDH, dysplasia, destroyed hip and septic arthritis. False positives, um, secondary to pain, if pain isn't considered a true positive from osteoarthritis or avascular necrosis. False negatives, off the eased hip, the pelvis doesn't dip down. The test is invalid if the patient doesn't understand, isn't able to cooperate, has a problem with balance. 
There are some trick maneuvers which you need to be aware of that the patient might use. Um, they may lean over to one side to gain, to, to, to shift that moment. So you've got to ask them to stand up tall and straight. And also they sometimes can flex the non-weight bearing leg and this uses muscles above the pelvis to maintain the level pelvis. So be aware of that. Get the patient then to lie supine and you want to square the pelvis. Squaring the pelvis is very important. What do you mean by squaring the pelvis? You get both anterior superior spines are level with each other and they're perpendicular to the couch. And it's important because all measurements of deformity and leg lengths are based on the square pelvis. Make sure the patient's completely flat. The couch is fairly firm, not too hard and not too soft. And ideally, make sure there's no breaks in the couch as well, although sometimes you get what you're given. Uh, you want to reconfirm any previous findings. And then if there's any new obvious findings, you want to mention that to the examiners. And you're literally looking for a symmetry deformity, deformity malalignment of the legs. Palpation is next. At least offer to palpate the hip. You probably won't be asked to do this. The problem is that the hip is a deep joint. It's difficult to feel for an effusion or any uh, synovitis. Uh, they'll just ask you to move on. So Thomas test is next. This is again another test that you need to be at home and comfortable to do and get on with it and do it fast and slickly. It's a test that's usually well described by most candidates, but actually poorly performed in, in the stress of the examination. I think one of the key maneuvers for this test is rather than standing bolt upright during the test, I tend to kind of kneel, it, kneel into the couch, as you, as you see there, and I think that works quite well. And the test wants to eliminate any lumbar lordosis to um, unmask any fixed flexion deformity that's present in the hip. So you place your left hand under the lumbar spine. You want to flex up both hips and knees till any lumbar lordosis is eliminated. You test the good side first, so you get the patient to hold the affected side. And normally they should be able to completely extend the, the, the normal hip on the, on the couch with, with no, no concerns. Uh, if the spine arches up, then pressure is relieved on your left hand, and this unmasks the fixed flexion deformity. And at that stage, you get the patient to drop the uh, ankle onto the bed, and, the, and that's the ankle of, angle of fixed flexion deformity. There are a number of caveats with this test which you need to be aware of. You don't want to be too gentle flexing up the hip, opposite hip, because you won't uh, eliminate the, the fixed flexion deformity fully. If you're too aggressive, you'll flex up the hip and you'll get a false impression of a fixed flexion deformity. If they've got a painful arthrosis on the opposite side, then you need to be careful you don't hurt the patient. It doesn't go down well in the exam hurting patients. Perhaps once you might get away with it, but repeatedly it's not, it's not so good. And also, if they've got a total hip replacement on the opposite side, you should pick this up straight away and mention that you would have some concerns about dislocating the hip. And I think in most instances, you wouldn't perform Thomas tests in this situation. Oh, and the final thing, don't forget to put your hand under the lumbar spine. You know, when we test people, there's always one, one candidate out of 10 or two that just completely forget. So it doesn't look very good when, when that happens. So movements next. Movements is a very sensitive test for hip disease. If movements are restricted in all directions, think of TB, septic arthritis. If there's a reasonably well-preserved range of movement but pain on terminal movement, then think of osteoarthritis. And when the movements are restricted in one or more directions more than others, think of a deformed femoral head, avian or perfus disease. Um, I, you, you retest for active movements first and then passive, just because it's easier to do so and watch the patient when you're doing that. Make sure, again, you don't hurt the patient if it's painful, because again, it's not good to do that. Uh, you can measure flexion as part of Thomas' test, but I would caution you not to do so, unless you're very slick and very confident that you can do that. I think you can just get muddled up trying to do the two, two things together. Uh, so I don't do that. Um, with abduction, adduction, you've got to be careful stabilizing the pelvis as you get a false impression of hip movements. Um, extension we don't tend to, to do in the elderly patient. So with internal and external rotation and flexion, you flex up the hip and knee 90 degrees. Be careful because in the first slide, uh, the, the foot points laterally, the leg is being externally rotated, but the hip is being internally rotated. Likewise, with the second uh, picture, the foot is pointing medially 
uh, and it looks as though you're internally rotating the, 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 the hip, but you're externally rotating. External rotation in flexion is greater than internal rotation, 50 degrees to 40 degrees, unless there's excessive femoral antiversion. Again, abduction. Uh, I don't forget to stabilize the pelvis. That's very important. I tend to abduct the other leg. It stabilizes the patient pelvis much better and I think it's more accurate but again whatever works best for you if you want it in the midline that that should be okay as well abduction true abduction should be measured with the other leg in abduction but most of us measure with the leg in the neutral position it's just that when the leg crosses over it can potentially lead to, to misrepresentation uh, of movement around the hip and extension, as I said, be careful with extension uh, in the elderly. It can, be, it can be difficult to do. And in practice, we don't tend to do that. You may want to offer to do extension, but examiner will probably move you on. So apparent leg lengths, this used to be quite an important part, but it's become less so in the last few years. It's really to do with the fact that you've got five minutes to examine the hip in the intermediate case. And you've, there's parts of the exam that tend to get cut out to focus on other parts, which are... We're going to score you the mark. So you might want to mention the parent leg lengths, but the examiners are probably more keen that you go straight on to true leg lengths and then you know the difference between adduction and adduction contractures and, and how to measure that. So with true leg lengths, you want to def it's measured from the anterior superior leg spine to the medium malleolus. Make sure you accurately define the anterior superior leg sp spine. It's difficult if you've got an obese patient or they've had maybe a iliac crest bone graft. I think hooking your thumb up is, is quite a good way to do that and find it. Likewise, make sure you, you accurately define where the medium areolus is. Uh, I tend to measure it at the end because I think in the center is a bit too variable. So uh, be aware of that. Make sure you've used the tape measure before. Make sure your tape measure is long enough to measure uh, and make sure it's not sort of flimsy. That's going to the paper uh, measuring tapes that are going to tear because it just looks a bit sort of amateurish. Um, Legs must be placed in merely equivalent positions uh, because, as I mentioned, that that's um, how we measure true leg lengths. It should ideally be from the uh, centre of the femoral head, but it's too variable, so we choose the first fixed point, which is the anterior superior leg spine. So if there's any shortening, you want to quickly move on to Galeazzi's test, and this test demonstrates whether the shortening's in the tibia or femur, and you want to get the knees flexed up to 90 degrees, hips 45 degrees, heels together, and you're looking at the knee, um, whether it's projecting forwards or backwards, or upwards or downwards, so make a big show of looking from the side of the examination couch and also from the end as well, and you're looking, if the knee projects further forwards, it suggests that that femur is longer than the opposite leg, but it's more likely that the opposite femur is shortened. Likewise, if the knee looks, it appears higher than normal, it either indicates that that tibia is lengthened or more, or more likely that the tibia is shortened. It's usually quite straightforward, but I've just included this slide here. Just included this slide here. And this, the, the, the Galaxy's test becomes difficult when you've got hyperplastic legs, but the, it's been lengthened. So you're expecting it to be shorter because it's hyperplastic, but it's been lengthened. And then if you've had epiphysiodesis done on the opposite side, but that's, we can talk about that in the, in the clinicals this afternoon. That's just when it becomes difficult and that's your, you know, that's the next level, which we can talk about. Bryant's triangle test, that test for supertrochanteric shortening. It's a test, I don't think you'd be necessarily asked to draw it out on the patient. It's a bit messy and you've got 10 candidates, but you might be able to uh, need to demonstrate it with a tape measure or just with your fingers. And it's really, you drop a line from the anterior superior leg spine onto the bed, you feel for the greater trochanter and, and a line uh, is measured upwards from this and it meets that level C uh, or, or point C and then you draw a further line from the anterior superior leg spine to the greater tuberosity. So you've got an equilateral triangle and you, you're looking at both sides for equivalence. And if there's supertrochanteric shortening, there should be a shortening of the BC level. It's not always that helpful if there's shortening both sides. Um, you might just be asked about the principles of Bryant's triangle test from over the anterior superior leg spine, index finger over the greater tuberosity, and uh, so main finger over the greater tuberosity, in, uh, index finger over point C, and you're looking for any difference. 
and you get super talking to it shortening if there's like fractured neck of femur or septic arthritis. Uh, you're moving on to the lateral test. This is just a line that's drawn from the uh, anterior superior expanse to the ischial tuberosity. And normally the uh, trochanter should be uh, below or just at the line, but if it's above, it suggests shortening. There's some miscellaneous tests you, you might be asked. Impingement tests are becoming much more common, anterior, posterior, and Faber test. And for contractures, Olber's, Elias test, and Phelps test. I think what we'll do is we'll probably just go through these in the afternoon for, for sake of for, for time. Um, and don't forget to examine the lumbar spine and knee. Uh, test, mention the vascular status, thank the patient, and, and wash your hands. Any questions? You can catch me at coffee time if you like. I'll take one question for you. Yeah? So you're seven, you're five and six in the UK for uh, seven years. And short cases as well, yeah. Do you, when you have, when you have motion, uh -huh. is it active and then passive? So uh, act, active and you quickly move on to passive for ease, ease of purpose and ease of time. Okay, thank you. Some slides, please. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Haslam from Doncaster. As it's my birthday.